Hey everybody, it's Scott Mann, CEO and founder of the Stability Institute, where we broker knowledge and connect stability professionals on complex stability problems all over the world. And it's good to be uh, here with you in our Tampa studio. Uh, it's May 30th, 2014, and just a couple days ago, our Commander-in-Chief, President Barack Obama, uh, talked to the cadets at West Point Military Academy at their commencement. Uh, activities and he talked to them. The theme of it was really on terrorism and the president said a couple of things in that uh, speech that I think uh, are really worthy of commentary today um, as the director at the Institute and some things that I'd like to share with you and hopefully that you'll share with your network. Uh, the president said a couple of things that I think are really key. One is he, uh, he indicated that terrorism is still you know the greatest threat facing our nation today uh, and he also uh, talked about an initiative that he was sponsoring, a new initiative to train and uh, coach uh, other nations in counter-terror activities and to try to decrease the amount of unilateral activity that uh, we're doing around the world to bring up and build the capacity of other counter-terror forces all over the world. Um, as a result of that, in the wake of that, there was a lot of media attention to it. Uh, Tampa Tribune, Washington Post, New York Times, all uh, latched onto this. And there's been a lot of talk and buzz about this, as you can imagine. You know, billions of dollars being allocated uh, toward a new training initiative certainly gets the attention of many in the security community. And I'm sure a lot of the attention of those in our network right now. So. In that vein, I'd like to just kind of give you some commentary here. First of all, I commend the president for that approach. I do believe that Al-Qaeda and their affiliates still do represent uh, the greatest threat that we face. They are a strategic threat, and in many ways, they've str they're stronger than they've been, uh, if not ever, uh, but certainly stronger than they've been in a very long time. They control a lot of terrain. They control a lot of human terrain. Uh, and they are growing, learning, and expanding. So I agree with him there. I also agree with the President that I think it's a good move to expand our capacity building with our partner nations. I think it's extremely important to work with other countries on building up their capability to deal with this global threat of violent extremism, whether it's Al-Qaeda or other transnational threats. So definitely uh, a good approach that we need to take. But it's here that I'm going to issue kind of a caution that I, I think uh, it's time to throw something out here that I think we ought to think about uh, because my concern is that we're all going to rush in the direction of a singular counter-terror strategy of, of a top-down uh, strike type capability uh, whether it's with drones, special operations, clearing operations, uh, and all of those things that we normally do to project uh, against terror groups, capture or kill type operations. Uh, I want to caution about that and, 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 and here's why. Uh, first of all, what we've seen in a lot of these areas is that these types of operations can actually do two things. One, they can drive the extremists deeper into a supportive population and they can also drive that population, that is the host of these violent extremists further away from our strategic objectives and in many ways mobilize them against us for future strikes and future attacks. Now the reason for that is really pretty simple. We saw this in Afghanistan but we're also seeing it play out in many other at-risk undergoverned areas around the world. Al-Qaeda and their affiliates look for areas that are Islamic, that are undergoverned, that are clan and tribal based areas where social grievances are high, where civil society capacity, traditional governance is in disarray, and they could come in there, move in at a local level, and co-opt these local communities by providing services such as dispute resolution or even just outright coercion and intimidation. But at the end of the day, what is consistent is that they managed to set up a strategic safe haven deeply embedded within these clan and tribal honor-based areas. And when they do that, we generally come at them from the top. We come at them with drone strikes, we come at them with special operations raids, and in an honor-based society when you do that, when you come from the top like that, often what you do is you actually create a sense of revenge, 
uh, that can manifest in feud that we don't even understand. Blood feuds that, ma- that, that, that come calling days and months later uh, that we invoked through our actions that we don't even understand. So tribal clan society is the place where violent extremists like to go, they like to set up shop, and they understand how these clan societies operate. We, on the other hand, don't. And we apply the same tired, industrial age, top-down applications that tend to ostracize the community from what we're doing and push the extremists down into the population like a tick and a shaggy dog. So it's a bit of a pyrrhic victory in that you might capture or kill some key leaders, but in the process you're mobilizing large numbers of clan society members against us. Now, this isn't just the United States that this is happening with. There's a book out right now, and we're going to talk about this down the road, uh, called The Thistle and the Drone and other independent reporting that seems to indicate that in a lot of areas like Waziristan, uh, the federally administrated tribal areas of Pakistan, our drone strikes and our special operations raids are creating some significant issues there. Even the Pakistani military, who traditionally has managed the Fatah, the tribal areas of western Af- Pakistan pretty well, they are really starting to, uh, to reap it with the Tariqi Taliban. And a lot of it has to do with the incursions that they've made into the Fatah from the top down. And in doing so, they have invoked a level of badal or, or you know, blood feud revenge from these, these tribal groups like the Masoods who are striking deep into the heart of urban Pakistan, deep against the military structure. And so we need to take note of this. And I'm not advocating that we do away with drone strikes and raids and building counter-terror forces around the world. Those things do serve their purpose and certainly kill or capture missions in the proper context can be useful. What I am advocating, however, is that we become a little bit more cognizant of the environment in which we're working in. These at-risk, undergoverned areas that are generally Islamic and clan-based societies, we need to understand them better. We need to come at them with a more holistic approach. And when we talk about building partner nation capacity, we should look at working with our partners to do that. Working with our partners to understand local realities and appreciate local realities of the areas where we're operating. What does relative stability in this area look like? What are the sources of instability there? Who are the resilient actors who could help prop up the local community uh, against these violent extremists? So appreciating local realities is one. Two, building a network. Building a network of like-minded, relevant actors across all disciplines, security, economic development, governance, private sector, academia, public, bringing all of these network members together around these complex problems, framing the problems, and then stepping off together as a network to solve them. This is something we started to do in Afghanistan, and we need to continue this. It's not just a counter-terror effort. We've got to get broad, holistic, and multifaceted in how we do this. Number three, We need a bottom-up approach. Just coming from the top down will drive the extremists deeper into the population and push the population further from us. We know this. We, We need to come up with a way to learn from the experience of Afghanistan, Iraq, and other places to promote and advocate bottom-up solutions, community-based solutions that are locally appropriate and resonate with the folks who live there. Finding advisors and catalysts who are the right folks to live and work in these areas. Host nation special forces, host nation special operations, host nation police, host nation political advisors who can go into these rough areas and work from the bottom up to help build community resiliency and then when the time is right, connect to the formal government. And then finally, we need to to build a capacity with our partners and with ourselves to set a story, to tell a central narrative that resonates with all of the key audiences and then follow through with that story and the things that we do. Uh, As a community and with our partners, we have not done a good job of projecting a narrative that resonates with the people in these areas. And so what that's done is it's allowed the extremists to go into these rough places, advocate a narrative that Islam is under attack, and guess what? We're the ones attacking it. And then when we come at it with these counter-terror capabilities, whether they're drone strikes or soft raids, we play right into that narrative. So we are literally being baited into the biggest strategic bait in history. And we need to get better 
at telling our story, telling a story that's believable, that resonates with the local population, and then informing it with actions and deeds that make sense. That, that's the fourth thing that we really need to do there. Now we've learned a lot about how to do this. We, we know how to do this. We're still learning, but it's a bit like building the airplane in flight. And I'm really hoping that we don't just gravitate to these singular counter-terror solutions with this initiative that the President has put forward. We're on the right track. Advising our partners working by, with, and through is the right way to go, but we need a bottom-up and top-down approach. We need training in addition to just uh, terror, you know, strike raids, counter-terror strike raids and things like that and intelligence. We need training on things like how to recognize uh, honor-based societies and the differences between the societies of status that we come from. What are the Western biases that we unintentionally project on these areas? We've got to understand that from policy all the way down to tactical level. What are the tribal and clan dynamics that are at play there? How are those being exploited? If we don't understand that, we run the risk of just playing right into it. What are the sources of instability that are destabilizing the area? What are the root causes of instability that are giving uh, the fuel to the extremist flame that they're fanning there. What are those things? We've got to know what's destabilizing those areas. And oh, by the way, who are the resilient actors and how do we find them at these local levels who can be the antibodies to those sources of instability and that violent extremist intimidation? They're out there. We need a process for finding them and working with them. This is part of partner nation capacity building. Uh, negotiation skills, working with our partners, working with uh, community leaders, you know, helping community leaders stand up in the face of adverse intimidation. These are negotiation skills. Uh, this is the ability to put the other party first, to understand their goals, their concerns, and work with them on doing that. We can't shoot people in the face, kill our way to victory, and think that these local populations are going are gonna to move in our direction. Uh, also, dispute resolution. Understanding how informal civil society in these clan areas resolves disputes. This is very important. If we don't understand how they solve problems, then it's going to be very difficult uh, for us to counter or compete with anything that the violent extremists are doing in these areas. However, if we understand how they resolve problems and how they resolve disputes, then it's easier for us to work with our partners to identify resilient actors who can step in and do that. Uh, and these are all just a few. Agriculture, low-tech agriculture is another one. Uh, these are just a few of the key areas where we should focus our training. At the Stability Institute, that's what we specialize in. This is, this is what we do. We've built a, a massive network of practitioners, experts, operators who understand and appreciate these various problem sets, and we're getting better at it. So as we move forward, if you're, if you're in... Uh, if you're in the line of work that has to look at this initiative and you have to consider ways forward in the counter-terror threat, I hope you'll consider the Stability Institute and the capability and the network that we bring to bear on this because only by taking this holistic approach are we going to have a chance at uh, making our homeland and our allies safer. So I appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to watch this video. Uh, I hope that you'll share this video with the friends of your network and, uh, and, and in your social sphere. And I hope that you'll continue to dial into this, to the Stability Institute for the different products that we're putting out there. Until next time, this is Scott Mann, CEO and founder of Stability Institute, and thank you for watching.